Good evening. Welcome to tonight's show, uh, The Lessons of Vietnam, telling the real story of the, uh, the uh, American War in Vietnam and the men and women who served in that war. I'm your host, Bill Dixon, uh, Vietnam 1967-1968, part of the 159 Engineer Group, headquarters, headquarters company at Long Bend, uh, which was one of the largest military installations in the world at the time. I've uh, been told it was like 55,000 troops when I was there, and it got bigger afterwards. Uh, we're broadcasting from the international studios of Nissan Communications. Uh, we're putting it all together. Uh, this is how you see the show. If you uh, want to see some of the shows or review the shows you've already seen, you can go online just like you do, or you click on TV show, then you click on archives for the um, uh, see some of the past shows on demand whenever uh, you want to see it. You see our new logo there. I all gave some, some gave all. Help those who remember and teach those who don't. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're helping uh, Vietnam vets uh, relive. And, uh, because when you ask them, you know, when were you in Vietnam, most of us are going to say last night. So the most important part of this is to be on the show with questions or comments and so forth. Dial 919-518-9773, or even better, go on to Skype, and it's Computers 2K Voice. That is the letter 2, capital K, Voice. Okay, uh, as we're moving on tonight now, uh, again, it's very important that there's still 20 to 22 vets who commit suicide every day. And if you know someone that's out there who needs some help, it's out there. It's not like it uh, used to be. We're going to create all this uh, drama and so forth. If you dial 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 or send a text to 838-255 and let them know that you need the help or let them know that there's a veteran out there who needs help. But uh, let's reach out and see if we can not eliminate that 20 to 22 vets a day. That's just too many people uh, too many veterans who served our country that were losing uh, with all that skill and, and what they could become and so forth. Uh, the last show we had was uh, a symposium we held at the uh, North Carolina History Museum. Uh, PBS recorded it, and uh, they showed it on the air. Uh, also, now we're showing it. We have a little bit of uh, technical difficulties tonight, so we not, may not get it until the end of the show, but we will be showing it. Uh, as it says there, uh, it's Vietnam, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, Afghanistan. Similarities and differences, Part Two. There's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot more differences in, in the two, in the, in the uh, three uh, wars and so forth. Actually, four wars. Uh, it's amazing to see the similarities and differences. Uh, I had, uh, uh, I was quite surprised during the uh, symposium to uh, learn some things. Uh, the military learned a lot of things from the Vietnam War. It's like they forgot everything from Korea War and uh, went to the Vietnam War and learned a lot from the Vietnam War, which they've carried on and so forth. So what we're, we're still going to be talking about uh, the similarities and differences uh, tonight. So next slide, please. Okay, the Hoovy Institute uh, came out with this report by Bing West. Bing West was a Vietnam vet or is a Vietnam vet. And this article is Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, difference or the same. From 1965 to 1972 in Vietnam, we fought both a conventional and unconventional war against North Vietnamese divisions and a counterinsurgency campaign against guerrillas. We fought the NVA, North Vietnamese, was conventional war uh, pretty much. They were armed and trained just like our soldiers, they, except they had been fighting longer uh, they had almost as much equipment as we had. They just used their helicopters down in the south. They kept them uh, in their jets, mostly up, up uh, north to protect the homeland. Uh, the unconventional war and counterinsurgency basically was against the B.C., the Viet Cong, who the uh, NVA, uh, North Vietnamese regular army, uh, supplemented quite a bit, especially after Tet 68, where we wiped out the Viet Cong pretty much as a fighting unit, and uh, that's when the NVA started sending more and more uh, down of the uh, regular North Vietnamese soldier down to help 
supplement the ranks of the uh, Viet Cong or the VC, as we call them, uh, Vietnamese communists. We conducted a similar campaign in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2014 and also in Iraq from 2003 to, two, to 2011. Now, what are some of the similarities and differences among these three campaigns? We're going to discuss a little bit about what Bing West was uh, talking about, similarities and differences. Some of the similarities and differences was public support and presidential leadership. According to Bing West, there was not a whole lot of uh, leadership. Uh, all three dragged on at too long at too high a cost in casualties and money to sustain public support. President Johnson, Nixon, Bush, and Obama failed to lead the American people in support of the war. Uh, they just never really got the people behind the war. Uh, most people today don't even realize that we're still in a war. And we're still losing young men and women even today. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, uh, during the Vietnam War, it was shown on TV every night, and you almost see nothing whatsoever of what's going on today. Uh, very little on the news about it. It's really discouraging uh, to see how the press has got all this other junk on, and the fake news, as they call it, and don't have the young men and women who are serving our country uh, more information about them. Uh, I know during the Vietnam War, you saw uh, the caskets coming home, and you knew that uh, there was a price being paid. Uh, it's, not, it's not exactly a pretty sight to see those caskets coming home, but you knew that those were young men and women from our country who gave everything they had. And I think the people uh, need to see some of that to realize that there's still young men and women out there who have given everything they have for this country, the country called on. Okay? Policy objectives. In 1965, the goal was to prevent the Viet Cong guerrillas, supported by the North, North Vietnam Regular Army, from overthrowing the South Vietnamese government. By 1968, Mr. Johnson, or President Johnson, had lost sight of any coherent objective. In other words, we weren't there to win the war. We weren't there to do much of anything besides keep, those guys, keep the North from taking over the South, and that got to be questionable sometime. Between 1969 and 1972, uh, President Nixon pulled out our, our troops while promising to continue military aid to South Vietnam. Now, how did that work out? When he resigned from office in his grace, his promise counted for nothing. All the promises we made, which is probably some of the reasons uh, we promised uh, the North reparations, we promised to help the South, uh, and uh, we didn't give it. Uh, United States government uh, decided, Congress decided not to give any more money uh, to the South Vietnamese. In fact, when Gerald Ford asked for the money that was promised to go to South Vietnam so they could continue the war, Congress got up and walked out on him. So uh, I promised our ally there uh, won't worth a whole lot either. Uh, in all three campaigns, no president followed the policy goals or the military strategy of his predecessor. Indeed, in their election campaign, Nixon and Obama largely rep repudiated, it's easy for y'all to say, the goals of their predecessors. In other words, they kind of blamed it all on everybody else. Now, what was the military strategy? Well, from 1965 to mid-1968, the goal was to kill so many of the North Vietnamese soldiers and Viet Cong guerrillas, they would quit. And we killed a lot of them, and they still didn't quit. Laos and North Vietnam were granted sanctuary status off-limits to American ground forces. We were not allowed to go into North Vietnam officially. We were not allowed to go into Laos officially on the ground, now that we had helicopters go in and pick up um, uh, downed pilots and so forth. But even in Laos, because Laos was supposed to be a neutral company, country, uh, when uh, American fighter pilots or helicopter uh, pilots were shot down, they, we only had about a 12-hour window to rescue those, and we couldn't go back in. Uh, the uh, American ambassador to Laos would not allow us back in, uh, to uh, rescue uh, because the, neutral the seemingly neutrality of Laos, which was the major highway for the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, 
American aid air could bomb bridges and military vehicles, but not cities, industrial centers, or, or the dikes sustaining North Vietnamese agriculture. See, Hanoi is below sea level, somewhat similar to um, New Orleans. And you all know what happened to the dikes in New Orleans when they fell. New Orleans was uh, flooded. We were never allowed to bomb the dikes of North Vietnam, and we could have flooded the city of Hanoi, which would have helped in the war. From 1968 to 1972, more attention was paid successfully to work with local South Vietnamese forces to destroy the Viet Cong. Vietnamization. By 1972, despite the withdrawal of American ground forces, the North Vietnamese were battered when they tried a conventional offense in the face of American air power. Basically, what that is saying that the South Vietnamese soldiers stood up and fought well. Uh, overall, uh, there were some that had the same problem as others before who still were not trained well, who would run. But all in all, the South Vietnamese soldiers, along with the American air power, still went in and kicked butts for the North Vietnamese military who came down. You remember in 68, uh, the Viet Cong almost ceased to exist, so the North Vietnamese military, trained soldiers, uh, uniforms, pith helmets, and so forth came down. So We cut our aid to the south. Now, while we cut our aid to the south, Russia and China continued to aid to the north. In fact, they increased their aid. In 1975, the North won by the heavy weight of conventional attack. They marched down with artillery and tanks right down from the North, right on down uh, to uh, Saigon. I have a friend of mine that's Vietnamese. When Saigon fell, they continued to fight for another 30 days. They did not, re they did not uh, turn and run. Uh, like a lot of the South Vietnamese soldiers did. They continued fighting for another 30 days, but they ran out of ammunition, they ran out of food, and were eventually had to surrender, and they spent uh, 10 to 15 years in slave labor camps as a result of it uh, because the United States government, not the troops, not the United States people, but the United States government reneged on the promise that we would continue supporting financially, militarily, uh, the people of South Vietnam. In Vietnam, the American troops focused upon fighting the guerrilla and the conventional North Vietnamese units. No serious efforts were actually expended upon nation building. In other words, we didn't do a whole lot to help the South Vietnamese government uh, get stronger and so forth. The South Vietnamese had a functioning government system down to the village level. Uh, to say that it had a functioning is being, giving a lot of latitude because the Vietnamese government was so corrupt and had so much uh, inner fighting and so forth that it was hard to say how well it was functioning. Uh, they were, uh, the president was always scared of a coup coming along and taking him out of the office, so he usually kept uh, the crack units up close to uh, his place in Saigon so that there was a coup, his uh, best troops could come in and rescue him. So uh, that was part of him with the uh, leadership in the government of South Vietnam. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the mission of American soldiers expanded dramatically in diffused fighting power and focus. Killing the enemy was regulated to a distinctly and deliberately secondary mission. The four primary tasks were providing security to the population, assisting local officials to persuade the people to support the government, funding tens of thousands of development projects, and instituted the Western rule of law. We tried to teach them how to uh, live under democracy, tried to make a republic out of, out, of their, out of their country. Between late 2006 in Anbar province and late 2007 around Baghdad and to the north, Iraq stabilized, primarily because the Sunni tribes were compri who comprised the strongest tribes came over to the Americans. But when we pulled out the entire Iraqi fell apart, the military. Now, if you remember, we just talked about the South Vietnamese government, uh, as fractured as they were, did continue on in standing. But the 
uh, Iraq mil uh, government just fell apart. They, the Sunnis and all the tribes. Uh, so that was a big difference in the in the times we kind of pulled out and so forth. Okay. In Afghanistan, the military strategy was to build a democratic nation. With as General McChrystal raised it, five percent of the efforts by our conventional troops focused upon killing the enemy, and ninety-five percent focused upon protecting and persuading the. Pashtun tribes to reject the Taliban and support the dysfunctional Karzai government in Kabul, uh, which was uh, in Afghanistan. It was all basically so many different tribes. You had this tribe here, and you had the uh, war chief or whoever was in charge there, and you had another tribe. It was hard to get them all to come together and and work as one. Uh, they didn't trust each other, so trying to get uh, a, a government was was a challenge. The, allegate, the allegations that our forces in Iraq and Afghanistan gradually relearned the counterinsurgency lessons from Vietnam is bogus history. South Vietnam had a functioning police, district and village government apparatus. Americans did not try to win hearts and minds or persuade the village to support their local officials. Later, they, in, the early part, in the later part, they did. Development projects were few and trivial. While the top American generals in Vietnam did sensibly refine their operation in 1968, the focus was always upon finding and destroying the enemy, guerrillas, or conventional, not upon persuading the population to developing a democracy. We were never into nation building in, in Vietnam. We had, uh, we used to call those missions search and destroy, and they were changed later to, uh, I forgot what it was, but originally it was search and destroy. Uh, I'm not, I forgot what the uh, word I had, a senior moment, uh, and I can't remember right now what the new, new one was, but it's basically search out the enemy. Okay. Weapons. In Vietnam, neither side could see at night or detect units moving in the jungle or through the underbrush. The enemy employ, employed mines, improvised explosive uh, devices, IEDs, the proportion of overall IED injuries were higher, 6% in Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam, 15%. Big difference right there. However, this was due to fewer overall casualties. IEDs accounted for about 3,000 deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan versus 8,000 in Vietnam. And it's also, as far as weapons, Vietnam was kind of a uh, test facility for the Russians, the Chinese, and Americans to develop weapons. Uh, it was like having a war to uh, come up with uh, different weapons and new weapons. I mean, we tried a little bit of everything. We had uh, sensors dropped out of airplanes on jungle trails that were supposed to detect the urine smell of the enemy as they came by. But then they realized that the uh, urine smell, they couldn't tell it from a man or tiger. So that didn't work. Then they dropped sensors along, sound sensors, so they could hear the enemy. Uh, we tried. We had a little bit of everything coming along. Some of it kind of crazy. In Vietnam, our aircraft could still be shot down. We lost about a 10,000 planes and helicopters. That's a lot of helicopters and airplanes. Today, that seems astonishing. In Iraq and Afghanistan, our planes and helicopters were hit very rarely, while delivering devastating firepower with incredible accuracy. Prompt, precise, overwhelming firepower delivered by platforms based far from the battlefields, perhaps the single greatest change in ground warfare since World War II with the drones and uh, the uh, artillery and so forth that we have today uh, and smart bombs and rockets and so forth. True, digital technologies and computers are remarkable, but they comprise essential inputs. The, the output is the quantum increase in effective on-target firepower. We didn't have all that electronic uh, stuff uh, back during the Vietnam War. Okay. Fighting spirit and style. Vietnam was fought in thick underbrush and steep jungles for most part. It was a grunt warfare from roads. The machine gun was the heaviest weapon carried on patrol or sweep. A 60 caliber was about as big as most people carried uh, maybe a small couple of uh, artillery, I mean, not artillery pieces, but um, uh, 
not bazooka, art mortar rounds. I'm sorry. I tell you what, my my uh, half hammers is kicking in tonight. Uh, artillery and air war were called in when the fighting erupted. In other words, once the enemy stood and fought, we were under, when we were under, in a firefight, then we were able to call in the um, uh, artillery and and uh, airplanes and helicopters to support us. The vast majority of firefights occurred between dismounted infantry units far from vehicles. In other words, a grunt on the, on the ground. I think you missed one. Back one. Okay, go up and then. All right, I go, it's the next one. Iraq was an urban suburban war with heavy weapons on vehicles. Supporting those on patrol, walking down streets and through alleys. I remember when they first talking about start talking about all these armored cars and vehicles and the Humvees and so forth. I was saying, well, you know, my Jeep didn't have a whole lot of armor on it. Uh, in fact, it didn't have any armor on it. It was just an open Jeep. Uh, once in a while, you could put some sandbags in it. Uh, the heaviest urban clearing fights were to the Battle of Fallujah against Sunni insurgents in 2004 where 10,000 buildings were searched by 300 squads covered on each street by tanks. Now, in, this, in, that, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, they need those armored vehicles because they're fighting from street to street, city to city. Covered on, and they were covered, uh, 80 squads were covered on each street by tanks. Bradley fighting vehicles or Humvees with 50 caliber machine guns mounted on them. Also in Basra, Najaf, and Sadar City, Shiite militias erred by trying to mass against American firepower and were pummeled. In other words, if they got together as a group, going to ch going to charge and, and do a full-scale attack, a unit attack, uh, they were beat up pretty good by our firepower and our vehicles and so forth. Now, Afghanistan was a rural fight, but the dirt roads were passable enough for a fleet of rugged armored vehicles. They want a whole lot of roads in the jungles of Vietnam. Probably 80% of all patrols were supported by vehicle-mounted heavy weapons, which is another reason they, uh, they needed that, that armor and so forth. Okay. In Vietnam, fights range for several hours, sometimes all day. Now, that was a little later on after 68 when we were not fighting the Viet Cong as much. We were fighting the um, North Vietnamese rugglers, uh, the Viet Cong still had uh, generally was a pop-up, fire, and then run, fight for another day. Uh, the Vietnamese north and south were courageous and tenacious. The enemy fought like badgers, digging trenches in the soft earth and refusing to budge until they knew they were outflanked. In other words, they won't give up. In Iraq and Afghanistan, most fights were short. Used to helicopter gunships and air arrived within 20 minutes, delivering a precision accuracy unseen in Vietnam. Enemy soldiers were not tenacious and they did not linger. In other words, once those helicopters started coming in, they, they hit the road. They did not have discipline tactics. They were akin to the Apaches in 1870s, adept at employing cover and concealment, surprise and hasty retreat to live and fight another day. In Vietnam, the standard American tactic was to set up a base of fire and then send a maneuver element around the flank, usually taking a few hours. In Iraq and Afghanistan, our troops carried 90 pounds of armor. A 20-minute run was exhausting and had on, had on call massive firepower. Now, our flag jackets were a lot heavier than, than theirs, but they carry so much other equipment and so forth. I don't see how they can even move. You, you look at their uniforms, they got so much stuff strapped to them. I can't imagine even diving down on the ground to keep somebody from shooting at you with all they have on. Uh, and had and had on call massive firepower. In other words, whenever they were, they had uh, uh, ways to get into helicopters and, and airplanes to come in. Fire maneuver was replaced by fire and more fire. Night engagement were few because Americans' night vision system deterred the enemy. Now, a while ago I said, or, uh, Mr. Bing said that, that we didn't have night vision. We had some night vision uh, there, and it was not um, 
readily available, but there was some night vision. It wasn't the best in the world. Nothing like uh, what they have today. Links to homes. In this regard, the American culture side of the war in 21st century has no precedent. For an old grunt like me, speaking of Mr. Bing, the digital links to home, email, Skype, cell phones were a shock. In all previous wars, distance had created a psychological and emotional firewall. When you went to war, you entered a rocket ship and got off the other side of the moon. Uh, that was going to Vietnam. It was like the other side of the moon because we want nothing most of us ever seen or experienced before like the jungles and the heat and humidity of Vietnam. You loaded your rifle and focused your mind upon violence. You were no longer in Kansas or Laguna Beach or Dallas. Amen to that. In Iraq and Afghanistan, war for most included many forward operating bases, it took on a routine of a state police barracks or a fire station. You had to be alert to danger out on the roads. But once back inside, you relaxed, ate good food, and slept in a comfortable rack. With ample time to call the family, listen to complaints and worries, even offer advice on homework. Can't imagine. You were living in two different worlds, connected on an almost daily basis. I had a guy tell me not too long ago, he was talking to his wife, and they had some incoming coming in, uh, where it says up here that you were pretty safe. Uh, they still got, uh, those camps still get incoming. He was on, he was on uh, the phone, or actually on Skype, talking to his wife, and had some incoming. He kind of had to uh, say, honey, I got to go, so she couldn't hear the sounds and so forth, and he had to cut it off. So, uh, death. What distinguishes war from other political activities is its abrupt final consequences. The infliction and toleration of death determine who wins or loses. The willpower of the loser eventually cannot sustain the increasing cost in casualties. As we said before, we went into Vietnam and we said, we're going to kill more of your guys than you can uh, sustain but they proved that that didn't make any difference. How many of their people we kill, they kept coming. Their birth rate and the soldiers uh, were they, they drafted. Uh, it just didn't seem like it had an end. The degree of willingness to bear the cost usually differs among the co combatants, which was part of the problem today is we don't see where we're losing people because it's kind of not left out of the press. By 1783, England was unwilling to sustain the cost of fighting against George Washington's army of rebels. By Appomattox in 1865, the Confederate spirit to fight was extinguished by the staggering losses inflicted upon its troops, countryside, and people. In other words, they were losing the support of the people, and they were losing too many of their, of their soldiers, and it was hard to keep them uh, supplied and so forth with the uh, because the... Uh, Lanes of lanes of uh, communication and so forth were getting messed up by the loss of people. So, by 1972, the North Vietnamese forces had been badly mauled. Yet, so tight was the political control and so fierce the will of the Hanoi government that the North Vietnamese soldiers resumed the offensive once we left. The difference was there is they didn't care that much about what the people of their country had to say because they didn't have any say. Uh, it was run by communists. It was run by the Politburo. Uh, a few people there in uh, who ran the things, uh, the whole country in uh, Hanoi. So they didn't care what the people had to say. They kept right on taking their uh, young people and sending them off the war. In Vietnam, the suicide bombers were extremely rare. But tough fighters and resolute military leaders abounded in the armies of both South and North. They had some well-trained soldiers in both both groups, North and South, and uh, they had been they had experienced war and what to do with it for a long time.
we're going to see if we have solved the uh, technical problems. If not, we'll come back to the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation on the similarities and difference by Mr. Bing, but we're going to see if we can get this uh, uh, working. So give us a, uh, a moment, and uh, if it doesn't work, don't worry about it. We'll come right back on and do this, but we wanted to make sure we got the uh, symposium done. So I think it's really important to bring this up because that yellow ribbon program does make a big difference. Uh, they do a 30 day, of, they do events before they go obviously, but they do a 30 day event when they come back, get them back quicker than they do the 60, 90 day PDHRAs that Moses is really involved with. I'm involved with all of them, but it's made a world of difference to how these soldiers cope from those deployments and, and the, the after actions of uh, coming home and finding out things are a lot different or maybe better, maybe worse, but it's different when they come back. And so this helps them cope with it a lot better. This program has been very successful. Thank you. Continuation of the panel. Ah, oh, got an echo in my head. This is a continuation of the panel. Uh, this is uh, Sergeant Major uh, Andy Jackson uh, talking about the changes of the, with the soldiers today as they come home and the support they get. Yeah. Uh, the next question, we've already answered part of it, but I think there's still things out there. Uh, the after effects, uh, I know from uh, people coming back from Vietnam having problems with Agent Orange. Uh, Agent Orange was the catch-all. Uh, there was Agent Blue, there was Agent Pink, there was Agent White. Uh, the one that's really causing most of the problems was Agent Blue. Agent Orange being a defoliant, but it didn't affect the uh, rice patties which they were trying to, were trying to keep the rice paddies away from the enemy, so they put arsenic in basically in the Agent Orange and made it Agent Blue. So a lot of the problems that we're having today is from the arsenic and so forth that's in, uh, in the defoliants. But whereas another problem coming out, we've discovered that our children and our grandchildren, ones who had nothing to do with Vietnam, are coming down with these same things, these same illnesses, that the veterans coming down. It, sometimes it skipped a generation. The military is kind of, or the Pentagon has decided, yes, there's a problem, but we can't address it because we can't afford it. Uh, well, basically, if you have a child or grandchild that you think might be affected by Agent Orange, they want you to put them on a list so that if it ever gets around to uh, funding something for them, uh, that they will be already on the list. The uh, United States government has spent millions of dollars in Vietnam trying to help them with their Agent Orange problem, but I'm not certain they've done a whole lot with uh, the American soldiers. Uh, Post-traumatic stress. When we came home from Vietnam, uh, you were ba basically a malinger. You were, uh, they didn't recognize post-traumatic stress a whole lot. When I came home from Vietnam, uh, they, didn't want to, they didn't want to address it uh, back when I came home from Vietnam. Uh, we had that and uh, uh, jungle rot and a little bit of everything else and uh, malaria and so forth. I guess y'all had to take malaria pills just also, uh, but all the diseases and came back and, uh, and we came home quite often. The American legions and VFWs didn't want us because we were the first troops to lose the war. So they uh, didn't want us to join their organization because we weren't in a real war. And uh, so uh, we didn't get all these uh, 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 different grapes and so forth. I think it's fantastic that we have now the military has realized, uh, looking back at uh, Vietnam veteran, that all these programs they have now, which we didn't have, are so important. Uh, because today's soldier with a multiple deployment, uh, it, it's got to be emotionally and physically uh, really trying to come back and, and after deploying and deploying and deploying. And we had people that uh, served t several tours in Vietnam, but some of these uh, tours that y'all took were back to back and there was a very little time at home and so forth. It really didn't even get adjusted to uh, what's going on. Uh, Andrew, what do you got uh, on that uh, as far as uh, when you came, the Vietnam veterans coming home, uh, as far as uh, 
Well, fortunately, the I've, I've not suffered from any of the debilitating effects. I've got friends that have Asian Orange problems uh, today. A lot of many of them are younger than I am, and were like aviators that might have come in contact with it once in a while or a little bit. But I was the infantry; I used to walk through fields of it, um, uh, elephant grass that was eight, nine, ten feet tall, and you'd come out the other end of it soaking wet, or you'd walk through a stream that was almost yellow with that fill up your canteen, drink it, animals running through it, all those type of things. But I never, um, I mean, when you got thirsty, you would drink. I don't care what you say, you're going to drink whatever's there. And um, because you can only take it for so long. But fortunately, knock on wood, I've not had any Asian orange issues to date. So, but I do have a number of personal friends and family, people I knew in the Guard. A lot of, the Guard ended up with a lot of Vietnam vets, especially in my unit. We were an aviation uh, unit with a lot of helicopters, so a lot of helicopter pilots came back. But as um, far as that goes, you know, I mean, uh, some other knees and joints and all those type things that, that show up with everybody eventually. But uh, fortunately, I've had a pretty good healthy life my whole life, so I haven't really suffered with any consequences of that. Yeah, I think a lot. most of the Vietnam vets who are down in the Delta area still have uh, problems with their feet as far as fungus and, and so forth because uh, it, it, it would grow anything down there. So uh, Gulf War II, y'all had, uh, where did the burn, burn pits come in with y'all? Was that, uh, the, what kind of effect did it have and what other kind of illnesses has come out of your? Well, the burn pits, we're still seeing the effects of, and I don't think they really actually have uh, tied anything to the burn pits, so to speak. Um, but when you think of the carcinogens that you're exposed to with the burn pits, it's not healthy. I mean, you're talking about everything that's being burned on compound to, like, literally, that's all you smell. So all your plastics, all of your ammunition, human waste, um, human medical leftover. I mean, everything you can think of that you would generate as trash is burned and you're inhaling it in and you don't have a choice to walk away from it. You're gonna inhale it whether you want to or not. Um, from, you know, you guys had to take malaria pills. You know, in 04, we had to take malaria pills. By the time I got there in 09, same region, we didn't have to take malaria pills anymore. So, uh, you know, we used to have uh, Malaria Thursday. You used to have to line, line up in line just so the medic could give you your malaria pill and he had to physically watch you swallow and then inspect your mouth to make sure that you took your pill because usually about 48 hours later, we knew where you were going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Just from the, the after effects of the malaria. Um, yeah, that, that always kept the barrels busy. Yeah, I'm telling you, yes, sir, it did. Um, but the biggest thing that really come out of our area is, you know, is going to be all the anxiety, depression, and, you know, and the PTSD that we later saw on our soldiers. And, um, and that, was, that was really, really hard for the Army to deal with when we first got back because you know, PTSD you know, had a huge stigma. It still has a huge stigma. I, I would say this, that the Army still has a long ways to go to defeat that stigma because there are leaders out there that think you should just suck it up and drive on. They don't really understand what the soldiers are dealing with. Um, you know, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this, I brought an 18-year-old home that survived an IED and multiple direct fire engagements only to take his life with a 22. So it is real. It happens every day. And unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of people don't want to admit it. And that's within our own ranks. That's not just, you know, our government or the VA. That's, that's within our own ranks. Um, so, you know, that's something we deal with, as I'm sure that, you know, the Vietnam era had to deal with as well. But just, you know, with a different name and a different code. And, um, but well, the biggest thing, if I had anything to say, and, and I'll tell you just a small part of me, is um, sometimes we have to do a gut check and check ourselves, you know, as soldiers. And um, that was the hardest thing I had to do. So as a senior leader, as a first sergeant, I had to go to my sergeant major and say, hey, I need to take a knee. And this is why I need to take a knee, because I saw too many of my kids taking their own life, and I realized I was going down the same road. I was using alcohol to cover my symptoms. I was watching my family deteriorate in front of me. I myself was deteriorating, and I had to take that knee. And I'll tell you, the command will tell you, yeah, go ahead and take that knee, do what you got to do. But then when you come back, that's when you're going to reap the uh, unfortunate benefits of that stigma that they really don't got your back. A lot of the times during Vietnam with you guys and stuff like that, a lot of the a lot of the folks that were acceptable to shell shock at the time because it was PTSD wasn't diagnosed in the DSM-4 until after Vietnam. But a lot of those folks, I would attest, would probably die in theater operations. Like the command wouldn't identify them being at risk with PTSD or any or even TBI, traumatic brain injury, because a lot of the situations they would die in country. 
Um, medicine's kind of changed because I can talk on, on behalf of being a Navy corpsman that a lot of the combat medics and Navy corpsmen that were out there in the field and stuff brought a lot of the guys and gals back home off these uh, rigorous deployments and they were coming back home with severe injuries and survivable injuries but they came home nevertheless so a lot of substance abuse is incurred with um, my population group with Afghanistan and the burn pits I mean just to throw it out there our arsenal that we ended up using was a lot of depleted uranium and stuff like that so that's a, an added play to the stuff that we were exposed to in addition unlike other wars and stuff I, I don't I think statistically with Afghanistan and Iraq, for some odd reason, there were multiple munitions going off, like IUDs, um, explosive devices and stuff like that, that just was constantly going off around most folks. And what's unique about Afghanistan and Iraq compared to Vietnam or Persian Gulf is the fact that it didn't matter whether or not you were a front, um, front line soldier or Marine, anybody in the theater or combat theater operations, whether or not you were um, a cook on base or whatnot, was, was exposed to some type of combat threat wherever they were deployed at. And what's also unique is that, I don't know about yourself, but I know with sometimes with our patrols, we would just tag a female service member to come out with us just so we had a female with us whenever we were talking to other females out in country too. So we put a lot of people in harm's way. So there's been a lot of uh, women health issues that have been popping up that's been identified because we have a lot more female service members in harm's way. In addition to substance abuse, I think obesity, uh, oh, I'm sorry, like overeating, overindulging with foods to uh, recreational drugs to, you know, like um, marijuana and stuff to curb the PTSD appetite to some risky behavior between going on a motorcycle, um, doing at-risk activities, whether or not it's at bars or fighting or, you know, engaging in rock climbing without like special equipment and that kind of thing are some additives to what we've been suffering when we got back home. I do want to talk about COPD being like one of the medical conditions that are, are out there because of the best exposure from a lot of the buildings that were exploding around us. So a lot of Iraq, Afghanistan vets now are, report, are reporting a lot of sinus or upper respiratory um, types of infection to sleep apnea as well as PTSD. And of course the signature signs and the signature condition out of these two wars is the traumatic brain injury. I, I was going to ask you that. Uh, uh, you guys uh, give me your answer on this. In, in Vietnam, the helicopter was was so wonderful for if you were wounded within a short time, you were back where someone was taking care of you. Uh, and it's even better today, but I think with the IEDs and so forth, you're having people now who live, who may not have lived during the Vietnam War, so they're coming home with more injuries. I haven't seen the statistics or whatever, but I would think there'd be more uh, of you guys coming home uh, with severe injuries that would, may have died in the field or in the hospital. So you've got more um, situations there, I would think. Yeah, combat medicine's very improved. Huh? Combat medicine, like yeah. actual medicine on hand, but training-wise. I just saw some figures on that a couple of weeks ago, but I, I actually I can't remember the figures, but it's substantially different on survivability right now compared to what it was in Vietnam. Yeah. For loss of a leg or loss of an arm or an explosion, that type of thing, or even punchy stakes with um, bacteria and infection and yeah. that type of thing. So. All right. I got an, another question I want to throw out to you guys. Uh, how did you um, how did you relate or, or, or with civilians? Uh, I know in Vietnam uh, you could go off base and go to uh, uh, you go into Saigon or whatever, and the bar girl's there, and you buy Saigon tea or whatever. Uh, how much, how much back and forth did you have uh, with the civilians as far as? Well, y'all were in a compound, uh, compound that you hardly ever got out of, or that you go out on a regular basis and and intertwine with the natives. So in '04, basically, um, you know, you're your post, for a lack of a better word, 
basically was nothing but burned up sand with Constantino wire around it. So when you got done with your mission for the day, that's where you lived. So there was no interaction with the public as far as being able to go out, you know, buy from them, anything like that. You might would have like um, a little guy out the front gate that might sell you counterfeit DVDs or something, you know, but, you know, obviously with an armed guard, that was about as much interaction you had. When you were on patrol, you know, you, you try not to have too much interaction with them. Um, the kids was probably the biggest interaction, uh, but the kids, um, we learned very early on in 04 that once, once the enemy found out that the kids would flock us, they knew that it would kind of take our attention away from what we needed to be doing, and we would concentrate on the kids, and nine times out of ten, that's when you get hit. So what we would do is we would ask families to send us bags, of, or at least this was our TTP. We would ask our families to send us bags of candy, and uh, when we got ready to mount up on our vehicles and leave, we would throw candy everywhere to get the kids away from us because that is a lot of times when you got hit was when you were dismounting off your vehicles, getting ready to do a foot patrol, or when you were mounting your vehicles at the end of a foot patrol. So we'd get the kids away from it, so then that way if we got engaged, we didn't have kids that were getting hit, we could actually engage the enemy back. Um, and then in 09, it was a little different. You know, now, now we're having to go back and we're having to try to win the hearts and minds of the populace because we've, we've been there so long. You know, so now all of a sudden we create what's called the JSS, which is where we take an infantry company or a company in general and we put them in the heart of where the civilians live. So you have to interact with them. You use them to bring your water on. You use them to, to get your sewage out. You basically have to rely on that populace to help sustain you, and you undergo everything that they undergo. And that is really what actually changed things around in Iraq was when we actually started interacting with the populace more so we could actually start having that one-on-one -on -one connection versus what we did in 04 where it was the Wild West, us versus them, so to speak. So you're getting training on their culture? Yes, you do get, you get a small training on our culture, just enough to kind of give you a good footprint of what to expect when you get there. And then obviously, if you're real smart, you'll learn from your interpreters, and every time you're out, you'll try to pay attention to what's going on. And in that interaction with them, you'll pick up on their customs and their cultures. And unfortunately, by the time you really get to where you need to be, it's time for you to leave. Yeah. Uh, Afghanistan, how did you? It was pretty much the Wild West. I mean, we stayed pretty much away from them at first. Um, we had interactions with like some of the interpreters that we had um, back in those days we had the Northern Alliance so it was uh, basically a tribe that we were working with um, me being a corpsman and stuff like they gathered a lot of us medics and corpsmen that had special medicalized training and we ended up doing some hearts and minds things earlier on trying to treat families and children because in Afghanistan, unlike Iraq, there was a lot of ordnance left over by the Russians. So there was a lot of landmines, a lot of explosions that had nothing to do with the current conflict. I mean, they were just randomly out there. So there was a lot of EOD teams and, and mixed um, folks just trying to clear areas. But then we would always run across some civilian that ended up getting blasted, and we ended up um, assisting with that. So that was mainly my interactions. Um, they taught us a couple of phrases and words to kind of come up with, and I did enjoy the bread that they had. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, tried some of the local cuisine, such as like, you know, goat meat and stuff like that. But uh, the highlight interaction that I think most Afghanistan and Iraqi folks, both in both countries, uh, we called it a Haji Mart, which is pretty much we got the, the, the DVDs of like newly released movies that we could watch on our laptops or back in the fob. And do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I, I found out that in, in Vietnam, <clears throat> the kids learn, uh, the one thing the American soldiers taught the kids in Vietnam is how to cuss. Uh, they could, they could, they, boy, they, could, they, they knew every cuss word in the world, and they were good at it. That didn't change. Uh, you could always tell the ones that had been around soldiers because uh, uh, with their language that uh, you definitely knew that they had learned some English. Uh, uh, Next Pop quick, culture I'm and sorry. the music too, huh? and the music yeah. starts sharing lyrics and stuff, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> right. uh, let's talk a little, a little bit, just a moment, uh, before we finish up and go to the vet center. Uh, the women in the military. Uh, in Vietnam, we had uh, uh, the nurses mostly. Uh, we actually have one of our members who was worked an engineer. She actually carried a rifle, a shotgun and went out uh, on the helicopter and so forth. But most of the women were nurses or working in uh, civilian jobs. Uh, we have one of the young ladies sitting out in the audience that she was actually uh, working with the, uh, in the embassy there in Saigon. So there was not a whole lot of women in the military as far as uh, 
de dealing with and so forth on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, with yours now, there are more and more women who are getting involved in the military and going out. I know that at one time they were using, uh, because of the culture, they were using the women to talk to the women uh, in Afghanistan, I guess Iraq, uh, and so forth. But uh, how is it dealing with um, uh, men and women together uh, create challenges? Uh, how does it affect your day-to-day -day, uh, life in, in uh, uh, during the uh, Gulf War and in, in Afghanistan? So I'll speak in 2004 first because it was really, really different in 04 than what it was in 09. Um, so in 04, you know, I was an infantry squad leader. I didn't have no women. And uh, on the FOB that I was actually on, there was two. So out of 560 males, there were two females. So you can imagine they got a lot of attention. They were, you know, it, it, it wasn't, and it actually become, it shouldn't have been a distractor, but it was a distractor for many, those who just couldn't, you know, pay attention to what was going on. In 2009, those roles changed. You know, I saw females, you know, being gunners on, on a mini patrol, and they could gun just as damn good as any guy you put up there. And I take them on a combat patrol with me any day of the week. Um, in 2009, um, I had the opportunity to actually carry out some PAO, which is public relations, out on our patrols with us, you know, for the, to do some internal media. And I'll never forget it. It was, uh, it actually ended up being one of my soldier's wife that went out with us. And at first I was like, I don't know how this is going to go over too well. But it actually went over really, really good. And the Iraqi populace were very, very uh, receptive to her because they actually, um, the fear factor on their end went down because when they saw the female soldier there, we weren't out there actually like, you know, like how we would normally be postured to kick in doors or to do flash TCPs or anything like that. So it just, um, it just, it changed the dynamics of what we did in theater by, you know, incorporating more female soldiers in our ranks, not only just to be able to do female pat downs, but also, you know, in the culture that Iraq has, you know, because literally the females are so uh, protected and gated. So it allowed us to, to have a tool that we could use because um, every now and then, would you find weapons on females? Very rarely, but every now and then there would be that one bad guy who would take advantage of that wife or that, you know, that child that he had that was a female and, you know, and, and get really upset and irate, you know, and you would try to, try to listen to their culture and try to protect their culture as much as possible. So it gave us the ability to actually uh, bring another force multiplier to the table. And that's what female soldiers provide for us, is they bring a force multiplier to the battlefield that, you know, we didn't use and take advantage of in 04. But by the time 09 come along, we understood it, we used it, and uh, we reaped the benefits from it. Did you find that you had to uh, make certain adjustments for, for the women as opposed to the men, uh, hygiene and so forth? Uh, I mean... We did. So in like in 04, like literally I remember taking more water bottle showers than you can imagine. So this, this right here would have been a shower for four days. Literally, that little water bottle of water. And I, and I would sit that outside so it would get hot so I could take a shower. Um, the women soldiers that we had on the FOB, you know, they actually had, we had a little small connex that we had turned into a shower, and we actually had a 500-gallon um, thing up top that was painted black so that way it would heat up so we could make sure we met their needs and that they could actually have, you know, water. By the time 2009 come along, there was so much running water everywhere, there was nothing to worry about, and literally their needs were the same as my needs. There was really no difference. Um, you know, because we learned that. That was the difference between 04 when, you know, the mentality was, you know, a man can do these roles and a woman can't do those roles. So, you know, later on we start realizing, well, hey, you know, we can all do these roles and mm -hmm. we need to work together as a team because we have to if we're going to win this war because of the culture and what we were experiencing. Uh, when you went out, you were out for the day, you were out for several days, week. How, how long when you went out? Mission dependent. Um, most of the time when I would go outside the wire I would be, or outside the front gate, the mission could be anywhere between eight hours to ten hours. Um, in 04, I could go out and stay for several days, depending on if I was setting up an actual ambush, trying to catch them planting in IEDs. Um, if I was going through the Palm Grove, it just it really all depended on mission dependent. By the time 09 come around, you very rarely were going outside of the wire and staying any longer between eight to 12 hours. And then it would all depend. So you may go out there and your mission may only be for four hours. Another unit may get hit, and then now you're out there for over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So it just all really depends on mission. But you know, later on in the war, you know, it was lesser time out there than what it was in the beginning stages. Like very rarely carried an actual rucksack in the latter ports of the war. I would actually carry a bug out bag that would have like my poncho liner you know, an MRE, some extra ammo, some extra water in the event. I had a follow-on mission and didn't get a chance to come back and refit. Yeah. 
Moses, same question. Um, yeah, in Afghanistan, it was kind of unique because, I mean, it was like the first deployment. So we were all kind of learning as we went along. So that Wild West period of time, most of our females were back in the rear in a, um, a, a better um, camp, as per se. As we deployed up further, like we were out there for longer periods of time, just being dropped off, making sure we were like recon in place out, and then we would actually set up shop waiting for the main force to actually set up shop there. So it, it was unique and different. And then occasionally what we found out, um, particularly with, because uh, we were working with a lot of special ops, um, there was actually embedded women with some of the special operations crew and stuff like that with the foreign um, like um, services like Germany and then British and stuff like that. So um, it was kind of weird seeing that and there, there's barely enough female Marines at the time when we were deployed out in 01, but we had a few. Um, most of the females were Navy corpsmen. Um, I did have to, um, because I was a corpsman, I was tasked by a CO. Um, you're in charge of her, even though she outranks me to make sure all our hygiene stuff was taken care of. We ended up doing a makeshift um, sanitation area um, with, you know, her setting up like a, a mini shower and stuff like that. We we had bottles of water. We we actually used a um, a 10 gallon water can, so she can go ahead and um, you know do some hygiene stuff and stuff like that. So. I mean, we had a few, but relatively not that much. As we deployed in further deployments, as the years gone by, we had more and more of them, like both on the base or at FOBs, and, and of course, walking out with us on patrols and stuff like that. But they were highly motivated. I would lay down anything just to be with them. They, they were, some of them were a lot smarter with some of the grunts that we, I actually was around and stuff like that. They picked up pretty well, especially with the on-the-job training of like, how to dismount from the, air, um, from the vehicles and stuff like that, how to maintain fields of fire and that kind of thing. So they learned fast for not having an official course on how to be a grunt or how to clear a room. So that's that. Andrew, you, wanted, you got anything to add to that? or Nothing more than, you know, the only experience I have with them pretty much in my, in my years was as, as you said, nurses or donut dollies that we were all in love with. Yeah. Um, Donut dolls were red, part of the Red Cross. Right. They would. Uh, they worked at the Red Cross facility at On K, where I was our base camp. I got a few times to go back to there, and I would see them, and they were always appreciative because it gave you that little sense of home. Yeah. There, so that was a thing for us. I uh, want to take just a. When did the vet center uh, start? When would the when did that start? <clears throat> Okay. I'm happy to say the, the vet center was known as the Vietnam Veterans Center, and it was started by Max Cleveland. Um, he was the youngest director of the VA at the time before it was a cabinet level position. As you know, he was a combat Vietnam officer who happened to lose three limbs, um, both his arms and his legs. I mean, his two legs and one arm. Yeah, two legs. Sorry. And, um, Basically, the VA wasn't too receptive of the Vietnam veterans coming home, either with benefits or health care. So he developed a pilot program, which was only supposed to last a year, um, called the Vietnam Veterans Centers. And he basically hired a bunch of his combat battle buddies to man up the small office spaces. And the mission was to go out there, find those Vietnam veterans, bring them on in and see what you can do with getting them linked up to services, both with the state and the federal government. However it took, just find a way to reach out to them. So the pilot program went on to a year. They ended up attaching themselves to universities and schools in the local area, linking up with mental health professionals outside. They ended up grabbing Vietnam veterans no matter where they were at, whether or not they were at bars, out on the street, homeless, at job fairs, miscellaneous, anywhere just went out, grabbed them, brought them into the vet center, one combat vet to another, trying to help them figure things out, both within the VA and with society. So they had these uh, famous rap sessions, which were the circles of guys being able to talk about their daily life, what's going on presently, what they were experiencing when they were deployed, how they felt when they came back home, what they were currently doing now, and what their future aspirations. And during this rap session, because we all know peer-to-peer -peer counseling works best than anything out there, 
they got to see different stages of other combat veterans and see I can be like him, you know, be employed, have children, maintain a family thing, or, you know, veterans were helping each other. And then uh, I think the Vet Center program was instrumental in getting PTSD recognized on the DSM-4, which a lot of people don't know. And now it's a full program with its own budget and its own rules and regs outside the VA, but still within the VA. Uh, so currently, the Vet Center program now, as it states, we have um, vet centers throughout the United States and into the US territories. We also have mobile vehicle teams that go out in outreach in rural areas. They've hired me, a combat veteran in this recent war, to kind of relate better with our returning Iraq and Afghanistan vets and family members. We've opened up our, our eligibility status, not just to Vietnam veterans, because we ended up changing our name to Vet Center, to open it up to World War II Korea, and then now to all combat theater operations. We're the only portion of the VA that can service active duty service members. We have hired family therapists to treat the whole family. So unless, unlike our, the rest of our VA partners, we, um, we try to tr trend into different things. So we have a family therapist to treat children, parents, siblings, even significant others in the household. Uh, we do military sexual trauma because it's one of those things that is more prevalent now that we have more females in the ranks and then also in deployment, but it also happens to be with males, that's military sexual trauma. Um, in addition to that, we do offer one eligibility service for the vet centers that hopefully none of our service members ever have to use because it's, um, it's for their family. So we do bereavement counseling, which is counseling for family members who lost their loved ones in the line of duty. So that's the current um, makeup of the vet center. I wouldn't be amiss, but I do want to mention our partners with the VHA, with the medical center. They have what they call a transition team. Um, Shelton is here in the audience. He's with the transitional team. He's a transition patient advocate over the Durham VA Medical Center. Um, and what he does is to help with the transition of our current climate veterans um, access to care with the VA Medical Center. They also do a lot of case management with a lot of our severely wounded folks. But then because he's out there on the street like I am, um, it's open up to all errors. Anybody we come in contact in the general public when it comes to access to the VA, we try doing our utmost to educate and fill them back in. And that's what we do now. So basically any veteran out there, uh, there's something at the VA, at the vet center that can help them out with all the different programs and, and so forth you have. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Their biggest advantage is the lack of communication between them and say at the VA. They, the person, when they come in that door, they just deal with the vet center. They don't pass information out and that was the reason it was started it, for the Vietnam era guys that didn't want to go into the VA and start talking about PTSD or their nightmares and so forth because it would get into their records and the local governments or, or employers or whatever would find out about it. So the vet center was established to keep that confidentiality between them and their, their counselors and talkers. That's yeah, they, that was a protection Congress brought up to the vet center because there was really no diagnosis to be had. And right. because the vet center started off as peer to peer, but later grew on with actual clinicians and stuff. The one thing that we maintain with a vet center is that we can see under VA records, but VA can't, the rest of VA can't see under vet center records. So that protected a lot of our service members who happened to want to return back to be in law enforcement, fire department, state government, federal government, even for some folks that didn't want to lose their security clearances and stuff like that. Most recently, I know DOD and the federal government has released you know, policies on protecting folks that have been diagnosed with PTSD and not asking that question anymore during interview processes for like you know, working with DIA or CIA or FBI and that kind of thing. But there's still that stigma of being diagnosed and being seen for mental health conditions that people still have in the general public. But it's nice to know that the Vet Center will not release that medical information unless you physically come back to our center and ask for it to be um, processed with somebody else. So if somebody signed a medical release form with a service officer and somewhere else, 
they would get VA health records, but they wouldn't get vet center records. The only time we would release that if it was involved with somebody's uh, death or f fear of harming someone or something like that. I mean, along those same lines, if you've got someone who's having some issues, but uh, they also have weapons, they're not going to they're not going to lose their they're not going to lose their uh, uh, permits or anything just because they went to the vet center. That's correct, because we do not diagnose, we just treat. Okay, I think that's important to uh, difference because is, uh, to know there's a lot of veterans out there who would like to get help, but uh, for whatever reason, they're, they're scared. And, and the fact that uh, that kind of records are not, they're not asked, that kind of stuff is, is so important to uh, the veteran community out there. And uh, uh, does anybody out there have a question they'd like to uh, ask the panel here? Or would you like to say something from the, uh, from the VA? Uh, this is your time. Thank you for tuning in tonight for the uh, Vietnam, Gulf War, Gulf II, Afghanistan, similarities and differences. Uh, we're going to cut out the question and answers. Most of it has been covered. Uh, the last part that uh, Moses Gloria with the Vet Center is such inform uh, important information out there for veterans to see. So if you have uh, a veteran who needs some help uh, but a little bit uh, apprehensive about going to the VA hospital, uh, the vet center is a good opportunity. Uh, show them this part, last part of the, uh, of the show. Thank you very much for letting us go over time a little bit. Looking forward to seeing you. We have a special guest on our next show, which will be August 9th. Hope you have a great evening and good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>